Well, good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, I ask everyone to turn any electrical devices to silent. And first of all, item one on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we now turn to item two on the agenda, which is the issue of uh, BIFAB and the offshore wind energy sector, as well as the Scottish supply chain. And for this uh, part of this morning's meeting, we have Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work, uh, David Pratt, who is the Head of Planning and Strategy at Marine Scotland, and Andrew Hogg, Deputy Director for Energy Industries uh, at the Scottish Government. So I'll start by asking the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Thank you, Convener, and I appreciate the Committee's ongoing interest in fa uh, BIFAB and the uh, Scottish uh, supply chain. I um, appreciate this opportunity to share with you some of the work that we have been doing. Very mindful of the uh, parliamentary debate that we had in May as well, uh, which I think has helped uh, raise uh, awareness of, of some of the, a the actions. In terms of BIFAB, we've tried to be as, support as supportive as uh, possible uh, from their point of acquisition 14 months ago, trying to ensure a sustainable future uh, for uh, the company. I do remain cautiously optimistic that contracts will be secured for buying fab, but of course we need to ensure that the benefits reach the wider supply chain of renewables uh, in Scotland. Of course, I held uh, an offshore wind summit on the 2nd of May, and I emphasise the importance to the sector of utilising the Scottish supply chain in the build-out of projects uh, and targeted that towards um, the, the developers and the Tier 1 that uh, attended. Areas that we're exploring, and I touched on this in a parliamentary debate, to try and move this forward in terms of more supply chain work and more Scottish content. Uh, so areas that we're looking at, uh, at using to incentivise better behaviour here include the Crown Estate and also how the Scottish Parliament reviews and approves decommissioning plans. Now, from the summit, the sector and the industry themselves have made certain commitments around exploring collaboration uh, and working more closely with supply chain, and that's why I'm sure the committee will be aware of the Offshore Wind Industry Council's announcement just yesterday about taking forward a four-month in-depth analysis of the capabilities of the fixed bond foundations market in the UK with a focus on the requirement of buyers. We are working with them, as I say, on the commitments that they've made to us, and I would intend to reconvene that summit and uh, invite yourself or whatever representative of the committee you deem appropriate to that next um, summit, probably later uh, in the year, um, because I do recognise that we're all in agreement that we want greater benefits to come to, to Scotland, the industrial benefits of the uh, renewables um, sector that we've been so supportive of, convener. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just, just on your last point, I don't think um, myself or a committee member was present at the first meeting. No. no. And I think w the committee had requested that opportunity. That's right. I'm happy to explain why I felt that that was not uh, as helpful at that point, I think, as it now might be. Well, it might be helpful to hear that explanation. Okay. At, at the summit... Um, to bring together the developers, I wanted to express to them very clearly the disappointment that the Scottish Government has felt around the lack of Scottish content, um, uh, supply chain benefits and industrial benefits, particularly around fabrication from the uh, support that we've given to renewables. But I also wanted to do it in a way to, to try and drive good behaviour and best practice. Now, the trade unions wish this summit to go ahead, of course, and I also wanted to involve UK government. So I met privately, I, well, I had a private call with Claire Perry, she's of course the UK Energy Minister, and she committed to attend, in the end she couldn't attend, but sent officials. So I wanted the summit to be a good, strong place to have a quite a frank conversation about our sense of disappointment, uh, and then got on to actions that could uh, remedy the situation. Uh, so I feel that like I have absolutely um, made that point to the sector. I had been doing it individually, but I wanted to do it collectively with everyone in the room, including the trade unions who were represented uh, at the summit. Uh, and when we come to the next summit, I think we need to see what the actions are, 
what has been delivered. Uh, and as I say, I'm, a, I'm happy if the committee wishes to be represented at that. But I wanted the opportunity for me to be very direct with the sector, and that's what I've done. Um, well, maybe others, others will want to come back to that point. Uh, can you tell us specifically what options the Scottish Government has been following to try and ensure um, there's more benefit to the Scottish economy and more um, usage of Scottish firms in terms of the offshore wind sector? You mentioned that there were specifics that you discussed at that summit. Um, can you share some of the specifics with us of what the Scottish Government is doing? Since I came into post, we've been exploring possibilities. So a lot of people very genuinely raise issues. Well, can the planning regime be used? Well, no, not to nail down guaranteed um, local supply chain content. Can the consenting regime be used? Well, no, we're advised it can't to nail down the supply chain benefits that we're trying to uh, deliver. Um, then we've looked at the, the main driver for these companies is the subsidy, CFD, Contract for Difference, where that subsidy will drive behaviour and it might make or break schemes, but that would be for the UK government to determine. Now, conditionality could be used, but that would be a decision for the UK government and they've chosen not to deploy conditionality, which would actually guarantee supply chain content as part of um, those uh, arrangements, those subsidy arrangements. So having worked very hard with officials to you know, turn over every stone to see how we could guarantee conditionality, because frankly, waiting on a voluntary basis for companies to do the right thing has clearly not been successful, which is why you then have to look, well, if the incentives aren't working, what is the big stick? What is the conditionality that, that you can use within state aid and legally as well? Uh, and that has been more difficult territory. So we've tried to create a culture of expectation to deliver those supply chain benefits. Um, there's been some commitments from companies in the past, whether they're legally enforceable or not. It's a separate question. But the two areas that I've explored that officials continue to work on that um, I've raised at the summit as a challenge to the sector, um, of course, we want better behaviour and more delivery delivered before we can potentially deploy these new tools. But the two new tools that we're looking at is, first of all, the Crown Estate. So for development to happen in the seabed, in the Crown Estate territory, it would require that leasing, which is done on a commercial basis. Uh, but we are looking at ways to incentivise, essentially. And ultimately, it would be ministers and our agents' decision if a consent was granted, if a lease was granted and our judgment as to what was appropriate. And again, we're taking advice as to what would be the appropriate uh, levers here to try and ensure that we get more benefits from developers. Uh, and as part of that, we could consider, or we are exploring this, um, you could look at carbon footprint as, a, as an issue here as well in terms of Crown Estate land. You say, well, why didn't you do that years ago? Well, committee will be well aware we didn't have devolution of Crown Estate years ago. It's a new power and a new area of authority. And therefore, we're exploring that to get the outcome that we desire. The second area is around decommissioning. And this is something that Parliament does consider, where de decommissioning plans are signed off, where there's an element of, of kind of guarantee or liability or assurance, if you like, that we're all satisfied that a developer's decommissioning plans are satisfactory. And I think there might also be room for opportunity within that, because we sign it off to create that culture of expectations of what we are looking for, for the sector to deliver overall, to be considered as part of the value for money and everything else as we sign off decommissioning. So that's two areas we're actively exploring, which wouldn't have been able to be delivered for this current round of contract for difference, but will give us an opportunity into the future. But these are signs of the Scottish Government having to explore really creatively devices to get what I think should have been delivered over the last number of years, which is companies just taking the lead and getting on with giving um, UK and Scottish companies the, the best possible chance to secure that onshore work for the offshore industry. And I suppose the final thing, convener, is to try and ensure that um, Scottish fabrication and Scottish manufacturing and Scottish uh, industry is as competitive as possible. And that's where some of the direct interventions, for example, around the direct support 
to buy fab is important. But if more companies are able to collaborate, share the good practice and build up their capacity, then I think the sector will be in an even stronger position. And that was one of the commitments coming from the summit, that tier one developers will assist supply chain companies to collaborate, to develop the resource, to be in a stronger position to then secure work, notwithstanding other issues I suspect we'll go over this morning. But that's a, that's a key new levers, convener. All right, just, just before we come on to questions from Andy Whiteman, I mean, one, one thing that one witness who came to the committee, Bill Elkington, who's the chairman and founder of JV Driver Group, um, he commented on the methyl yard not being world class and needing improvements. Now, it's owned by Scottish Enterprise. That was a specific example, I think, where the suggestion is that the facilities are not up to, up to standard. I mean, is that an area where the Scottish Government can assist or seek to improve matters? I, I believe it is, Convener, but the timing will have to be right for, a, for the reason I'll, I'll give now. I, I mean, I've heard that issue before about investment that can go into the yard. The issue with uh, that site being Scottish Enterprise owned, it will have to be state aid compliant. So if there's a, a financial investment in a yard, depending on the status at the time, what work might have been involved, it might uh, come into conflict with state aid rules. Um, so there is a question of um, if work is secured for the yard. For, I mean, for example, if um, Scottish Enterprise, funded for, by government or whoever, had just invested in the yard, um, the company Bifab might just have had to have paid it back in rent. So I think there's a financial fix that has to be agreed there so we don't flout state aid rules. So there's certainly a desire to invest in the yard, but it must be able to be done in a way that's state aid compliant. And that essentially will be around the timing of award of contracts and then the security that the yard has as well. Officials can say more if you like, but there's not a lack of willing to invest in the yard. It's just at the point in time at which we can do it it is absolutely critical so that any investment is, is legal. Uh, there are ongoing meetings in relation to investment in the yard that may well find a way through this, but there's certainly a desire to invest in the yard, but it is a question of timing and at the point in which contracts are being uh, given as not to give it an uncompetitive uh, advantage, which would then come into state aid territory. If you wish more officials can add more to that. Uh, if they could, that would be helpful. No, I think the Cabinet Secretary's covered the, the, the key points there. I mean, we, we meet regularly with what's called the Fife um, Infrastructure Group, which involves the, the local authority, the business, the enterprise agency who own the, the, the NG Park Fife. Um, and we are in regular dialogue about, about different options for how investment, how investment can take place, what that investment might look like. But um, as the Cabinet Secretary suggested, timing is key, and also the securing of new work at that yard is also important. Um, but we are exploring all, all options, uh, and that they are, they are live discussions that are ongoing just now. Um, can you give us any indication how state aid rules affect that? So, so for example, just now, if if we were to invest in one of the one of the most urgent and pressing matters is a concrete slab at the yard to, to improve the conditions underfoot. Um, if we were to invest in that just now, in public sector, we would have to recover um, the vast majority of that investment um, back from the company in rent. And that's a very difficult discussion to have at a time when the company is still trying to compete for new new business. So it's it's that that goes back to the point about timing. We we couldn't just give it without any financial return. It'd just be a direct subsidy. That's the point. It flouts state aid. Yeah, but is it is it not a bit circular? As in, if you can't provide the facilities for the company to compete, then I mean, is it just that? It's an uncompetitive as a location. No, I, I don't think that would be a, a critique. I mean, I think if uh, there would be an elegant solution if a company said we want to award a contract and the only issue is the lack of concrete, then I'm sure there would be an easy fix there if that was the critique, but it's not. I, I think as soon as, they have, uh, as soon as we have a vehicle to be able to invest in the yard, uh, that we will. Uh, but I don't think a company is saying they're not you know, securing work because of that lack of hard standing. But I get the point, there is indeed a circular benefit the minute they get a contract, then it will probably allow them to have the financial security that allows us to invest and then revisit the rent issue to make sure that there is no difficulty with state aid. So there is, 
uh, certainly multiple benefits from securing a contract. All right, we'll come on to questions from Andy White. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. You said the, um, the, um, the offshore wind supply chain summit will be held, another meeting will be held later uh, in the year. Um, can you confirm that the actions that were agreed by the attendees will all have been completed by then? Well, I can certainly speak on Scottish Government's. Yes, number um, two, the Scottish Government will continue to investigate the levers. Yes, absolutely. Completed so we, investigations so, by then. So yes, we will have completed those investigations. The UK yeah. Government reviewing the CFD and supply chain plans. Do so you I can't. Commitment, you know, a commitment from them, or I, I cannot speak for the UK no, no. Government, uh, and um, that's probably a good thing. Uh, but I would encourage them to revisit the CFD. They are reviewing it. It's not, it's not widely known that they're reviewing the contract for different scheme. But there's, there's a very blunt policy choice here. I'm setting out the Scottish Government's position. We want supply chain benefits. We're going to do something about it. We're going to do something about it with the new powers that we have and the window of opportunity that we have. Nothing else has worked, and we have tried exhaustively. But actually, the lever here that could get conditionality, guaranteed local content in the supply chain, would be from those who pay the subsidy, the UK Government through CFD. I did actually pose that question. Why not do it? The answer I've had is essentially cost over conditionality that, you know, there's a policy choice here. There is a view that it might be a bit more costly if you force UK and therefore Scottish supply chain content. Surely we, we are agreed that that is still a price worth paying in terms of the benefits that will come to, to industry in the new renewable sector. So uh, but it will be for UK government to review that decision, not Scottish government, but I'd encourage them to take that step because I've set out a new commitment, 60% by way of content, but if you don't have any levers to deliver it, then it's pie in the sky. It's a commitment that will be meaningless. But you, you, you will be pressing the UK government to make as much progress as possible. Of course, for the yes. next summit. And then the representatives from the offshore wind sector undertaking a strategic capability assessment of fabrication three to four months, so that should be complete. Yes. Keeping an eye on yes. them. And then work to, was required to review conditions and processes for contracting and risk allocation, the offshore wind sector to explore and evaluate further, I presume that's a little bit more porous in terms of time scales. That's up to them, of course. It, it, it is up to them. Um, and in calling the summit, you know, I was setting out to the sector, well, here's what we're going to do. And what do you have for us? Essentially, what's your contribution? How do you propose to change things? And that was their suggestions. Mm -hmm. And it does relate to the thing with the £100 million commitment around um, a developing the supply chain. It sounds like, sounds like a lot of money um, if it was in short order, but it's not impressive when you look at the overall scale of investment in the sector. It's not as impressive. But what I want to see is tangible improvements in actual work given to Scottish yards. And that, for me, would be the testimony of success here. OK, moving on. Um, have, you, have the Scottish Government done any assessment of the carbon emissions impact of building... Um, jackets for the EDF project in Indonesia? We, we've done, a, a, as um, critics have done, a tabletop um, exercise into that. I don't necessarily want to get too drawn into how many cars equivalent it is, but because the basic point here is it not better for the work to be done as close to site as possible. And to that, of course, we say, well, I would say we agree. So there certainly is an impact, of course, if work was to be awarded elsewhere and then simply transported so far, um, th there would be there would be a, a carbon impact there, yes. Okay, and moving on to the current state, you mentioned you're exploring that. Of course, you um, you manage the seabed on behalf of the Crown. Um, I moved an amendment to scrap the Crown's rights to give ministers exclusive control, but that was ruled out of scope. But nevertheless, you have, through Crown Estate Scotland, um, exclusive competence in managing that interest. You say you're ex evaluating the scope there. What are the kind of boundaries of that scope? Um, if, if, I, if I were to say that the scope for that is pretty limitless, you can do what you like there. You could, you could refuse to lease land to a company that wasn't prepared to enter into legally binding commitments on supply chain. What, what would potentially be the problems um, with that approach? Just in broad terms, because obviously you're in the midst of a 
exploring these? Um, that was a very charged question. You've said, what are the limits, but just in broad terms. Um, no, I just mean, is it, is it state aids? Is it the Crown Estate yeah. Act? Is it, I mean, what, what's, what's the, what are the issues at play? So I think we can be creative now. I'm, I've not brought the legal team with me. David can speak for uh, Marine Scotland. But whatever we do, of course, we have to work within the law. And we, all, we obviously have to look ahead to what's fair and a proportionate approach to an issue. Um, because we have that competence now over Crown Estate, we do decide you know, what is the level of leasing that we would think would be acceptable, what are the conditions that we would allow activities um, to, to be undertaken. So whatever we do will have to be proportionate within the law, not, limit, not limitless, as Andy Whiteman may suggest, but so we have competence. But what we are doing, it will be building that expectation around, yes, the economic benefits, yes, the environmental impacts. So I think that's where the carbon point is very interesting, the emissions point is very interesting, eh, as how we, we build all that into a system. So we will have some time to, to construct a regime that tries to drive that. Um, but traditionally, leasing arrangements would have been over, you know, what's the, what's the economic contribution, what's the fee, what's the arrangements, what's the term of a lease? And I've been very clear as Finance Secretary, Economy Secretary, and I've engaged, of course, with the Environment Secretary, who leads on Crown Estate, to say, look, we have no way of getting conditionality around uh, those who are enjoying the benefits of the offshore renewable sector. A, those companies who are enjoying those benefits, who are getting those subsidies, we want them to be giving work to Scottish Yards. I'm looking at ways can that be in a consideration as part of the considerations of the Crown Estate. So we are we're exploring that at the moment um, uh, to see if we can produce a regime that, that's work that can be compliant uh, and get those desired outcomes. So you... you, you I mean, no, no offshore renewables can go ahead without permission to anchor them on the seabed, whether they're floating or... In the state, it would require our consent, yes. Yep. So right. you, you, you have the possibility to, say, offer a lease on full commercial terms with no strings attached or uh, a reduced level lease with legally binding agreements on supply chain. I'm trying to explore the degree of flexibility. It seems to me you have a fair degree of flexibility as the managing agent for the landowner. We, well, we will have some flexibility, but if I launch something that's premature, I'm only opening the government no, up to a legal challenge, and I'm trying to resist that. Mr Whiteman, I have a great deal of sympathy for when it comes to legal challenge, and we'll understand I'm trying not to open the government up to a vulnerability here. What I'm trying to do is help build a very strong and robust system to get the outcomes we want to get using one of the few devices we've got and the much easier solution to this is through CFD, but I don't control that. And just finally, you mentioned uh, marine planning, that that's not a, uh, an option you think is in play. Um, and on the face of it, that seems fairly uh, self-evident. Planning consents are for the use of land. They're not about who, who will develop and how they shall develop and procure. Um, but maybe it's my ignorance. I've just been through the planning bills. I should probably know, although we didn't focus much on marine planning. Um, I mean, there are Section 75 agreements in planning law. Do they not apply to or similar to marine planning? David. The Section 75s only apply onshore, and that, that's actually been a, a key issue with um, getting sort of um, associated benefit from a development offshore. So we've just had a planning bill coming through Parliament. Why didn't we use that as the option to extend Section 75 agreements offshore? Even, again, even, and I have no longer got responsibility for planning, but having been planning minister, as Mr Whiteman will also know, planning designation is really about land use or indeed sea use, if you, if you like, in terms of a marine. But you wouldn't be within planning, determining who got contracts, and that's what this is about. So it can, by all means, designate use of territory, zonal use, but it can't specify the work to deliver that use must go to that country, that yard, or that workforce. And that essentially is what this debate is about. Get that. Okay, thanks, Gordon MacDonald. <coughs> 
Thanks very much. Convener. We've already touched on the area of question I was going to ask about, about conditionality, and you've highlighted the, the issues that the Scottish Government is going to be doing in terms of decommissioning Crown Estate licences, etc. If the UK Government is reviewing its contract for differences and Scottish taxpayers through their utility bills actually subsidise a lot of the CFD, what changes do you want to see to these contracts that, that would benefit the Scottish economy? As I think I've uh, tried to uh, describe, convener, that a fundamental change would be to, say, put conditionality around the supply chain content. There's an ambition there to do it. Um, UK government will have to revisit the plan, how they get there. Mm. So far, in questioning the energy minister or me questioning UK civil servants who attended the summit, I, I wasn't much clear on how you get to that target without the levers to pull. Because it leaves us in the position that we're in right now, that we all share an ambition to get as much work as possible onshore from the offshore renewable sector. But because you can't compel it, you can't condition it, um, we're left at the mercy of the developers as to who gets the work. And I don't really see that changing terribly, even with the interventions around collaboration and more competitive um, partnerships. That's all great, but uh, is that the game changer? I don't think so. Um, he who pays the piper calls the tune, and you know that's where I think the difference could be. Uh, so, if there was conditionality in contract for difference in that regime, then then I think there would be more guaranteed supply chain content. Um, and that's not saying it would be an individual yard; it would be more to the nation, to the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us in Scotland, uh, knowing where the opportunities exist, I think that's what would make the difference. So it's a simple question of con conditionality. Uh, over cost, because yes, um, energy users are paying for this right now, but they're not getting the associated jobs that come along with that contribution. Uh, we heard from a uh, GV driver group um, when we had a round table that in Canada, um, if there are these local benefit agreements and companies fail to deliver what they committed to, then they can be fined. And one example they gave was up to £150 million. A company was fined for not delivering what they said in their contract bid. Is that something that you would encourage the UK government to look at? I'd encourage them to, to look at it. Uh, they, they'll obviously be working within EU and state aid law well, for the time being and you know, for as long as, uh, as, as possible as well. But um, I, I think you know, we've got a very close relationship naturally with DF Barnes, JV Driver, in terms of mm -hmm. the BIFAB owners, and we do engage with them regularly, and of course there is a different legal system in Canada than there is uh, in Scotland and in, in the UK, um, so we don't have this, some of the same devices that they have to ensure that those local community benefits, if we had, would be using them, I can assure Mr Macdonald of that, but we don't have that ability. Uh, to to enforce that. So that is a difference, but I would encourage the UK government to, to look at that. Okay, thanks. Um, Jamie Hilko Johnson, follow up. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I welcome uh, the fact that you're looking at the um, Crown Estate route, route. I was just wondering when that started, uh, your official started looking at that as a potential way of um, providing conditionality into it. We, so we got Crown Estate from last autumn. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it happens, the window of opportunity of new consents um, doesn't neatly fall upon this right now. So um, even if it was a great idea last autumn when we got devolution, that there was no consenting where well, this would have been um, appropriate or relevant or timely. So timing is not the question with Crown Estates. Not having had control over it before, we obviously could not have implemented it early. In it, early but, uh, but would you you'd be able to look at it and consider it and perhaps take legal advice, would you? I mean, I mean, it was recommended in the Smith Commission in 2014, came part of, part of the Scotland Act in 2016 and founded in 2017. Ha, is it only recently that, we've, that you've started looking at whether this could be a way of delivering? Yeah, that's delivering? right. Yeah, it's only recently. O off the back of... Um, the last couple of years, so there been a lot of commitments made to Scotland and made to the Scottish Government and others about supply chain benefits that would be coming to Scotland, and they haven't really materialised. Um, and I mean, I've been working very hard with officials to see well, what powers do we have, what levers do we have to just get conditionality here. So if it's not going to happen by by 
a kind of voluntary basis, hoping that companies do the right thing by Scotland, then what levers can we pull? And we haven't been able to find any legal route to compel companies to invest in Scotland, which is ultimately what we're now exploring. And now, naturally, we would all say it's self-evident that you should invest in Scotland, you'll get quality work, and it's, you know, it's, it's beneficial for us all. It, but in the absence of a legal remedy, when all the advice that I've been given is you could do it as part of contract for difference, but we don't control that, that's UK mm -hmm. government. So the one thing, it could be a game changer here, we don't control, so I am exhausting the system to see, well, what do we control that could be used competently and legally to get the same kind of outcome? And officials, as I say, now having management of the uh, Crown Estate are exploring that and uh, the decommissioning route, which considers many things. And I'm asking for the system to be considered to look at those value for money, economic benefit, environmental considerations uh, as well. Why is all this important? Because Parliament and ministers decide, ultimately. Agents act in ministers' name. And, you know, sometimes companies are telling us when it comes to giving work in Scotland, oh, it's difficult, Mr Mackay. It's difficult. So do you know what I'm going to say to some of these companies when they want to get the contracts, develop in Scotland, but not give us the jobs? I'm going to say it's difficult. It's difficult. So we have to create an environment in which our expectations are made clear. We should we come and invest in in Scotland, and that's why we're exploring the mechanisms to do it legally, of course, because we always want to act within the law, would we not, Mr Johnson? I'm sure we would. John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, could you maybe say something about the relationship with BIFAB f with the government? Uh, because as I understand it, there's a 20 eight percent shareholding that that may go up in the future so does that mean that the government has quite a lot of involvement or not a lot of involvement in the actual running of bifab we have involvement insofar as of course we want the yard to secure work that's what we're striving to achieve i support uh, the employees at the yard the trade unions are trying to get work we're supporting the company and understanding their issues again we're we're, we're looking at the investment propositions for uh, the, the yards, but uh, we are uh, we have a, an interest in terms of the stake in the company as well. Uh, we have uh, clearly been working to try and raise the overall issue of Scottish content supply chain benefits. That's overall for industry in Scotland. But the relationship we have with BIFAB, uh, with regular contact, regular political and official engagement, but we don't take any managerial operational control naturally. It is about understanding the company, the needs of the company, the experience in Scotland, and uh, be supportive as possible. And of course, we've got, we've got a commercially uh, confidential agreement about the, the nature of our uh, contribution uh, that goes along with that. And as reported to another committee in a confidential session, for reasons that remain confidential, um, there's also the issue where the government can offer guarantees uh, to companies as well, and that can help them secure work. If there was such an arrangement with BIFAB, that would be reported to the Finance Committee for their consideration as well, convener, but that would be commercially confidential and not for open public session. So, I mean, some shareholders in companies holding 28% would be involved in the management of the company. So is that a choice? Uh, is it because we've got um, complete confidence in the board and BIFAB and driver and all the rest of it? Uh, that we, there's nothing we can add to the management of the company? Uh, or is it, is, are there other reasons why there, there isn't involvement in the management? Well, essentially, civil servants um, are good at policy and running the bureaucracy of the country, but not necessarily directly run or have much to add to the running of an industrial um, company, so to speak. So we wouldn't take operational control. There's a, a place at the board, but that's mainly as observer uh, status, but kind of political official engagement's ongoing. So we wouldn't tell the company how to run its affairs, but we'll watch very closely the public interest for public interest and the, the actions of the company to, to, 
to be assured that what they're doing is, is the right thing and we're, we're alive to the decisions that they're making. And it gives us a much deeper and forensic understanding of the experience of the company. Um, but there'd be no reason for us to try and manage the company. Well, I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking day-to-day -day management, but there is, if I'm picking up correctly, there is one seat on the board that is a representative as, as a shareholder, of yes, the yes, Scottish yes, government. Yes, uh -huh. yes, oh, well, that's, that's, that's fair yeah, enough. But, but mainly acting as an observer uh -huh. rather than as a contributor to operational decisions. Yes, but, but you'd be aware of major decisions yes. that we're making. It, can you t tell us, I mean, the suggestion is it could go up to 38%. What, what are the, That's right. How, how does that happen or when would that happen or whatever? It's a bit like a potential drawdown of loan that the share in the company goes up by way of an equity uh, arrangement. So it can go up as high as 38% under the terms of the arrangement that we have with them. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Cabinet Secretary, we've touched on state aid, and uh, in the course of taking evidence, we've uh, had allegations that state aid rules appear to be getting flouted, uh, particularly in, in the case of Navantia, the Spanish state-owned company that outbid Bifab for the Kincardine wind farm work. Has the Scottish Government done any work in ascertaining whether this is in fact the case? It's not really for Scottish Government to do that work, so to speak. Um, certainly be aware of it and understand that it, it wouldn't be the norm for one. Uh, well, we, we're, we're not, um, we wouldn't be the notifying body as Scottish Government, one member state complaining about another member state, but actually a company, or, or indeed trade union, but a company probably more um, uh, well informed of the circumstances could complain to the Commission if they felt there was a state aid breach, they would be better positioned to do that, knowing the, the accusation that might be made, the detail, the finances, if there was reason to believe that that was true. Um, so it wouldn't be for Scottish Government to raise a complaint, therefore to do that work. If it was felt that there was grounds for a complaint, it would be for a company to lodge that with the Commission. And ultimately the European courts would, would determine, but the Commission in the first instance. Would an individual company really do that? Is there any case where that has happened in Scotland? Oh, I'd have to check back with their lawyers to understand if that was the case, but it wouldn't ordinarily be a government raising that kind of action. I'm not aware of Scottish government having done it for as long as I've been in government, but it would be for a company to pursue that rather than for us. I mean, clearly it puts Bifab in a, in a if it is true, in a difficult position. And how can it compete in that sort of environment and if you extend it to across the economy, the Scottish economy, is it happening elsewhere? Is there impact on the economy? Isn't it a quite an important issue? Well, I think it's an important issue, and I think that a, I, I know that we all want a level playing field, and we want everyone to play by the rules. We certainly do. Um, you know, we often bemoan state aid rules, but we we abide by the rules, and we want everyone else to abide by the rules as well. But if a company does feel as if they have that evidence, um, then they should raise a complaint with the Commission. Um, a company that's been involved, that can make the accusation, that can stack up the accusation with evidence is far better placed than anyone else to, to raise the complaint with the Commission. But we're looking specifically at Bifab here and the concerns about you know, making it into a, a flourishing, prosperous business. This is an issue which is specifically impacted on it according to the company, surely it puts them in a very difficult position, because even if they complain to the Commission, it's going to take how many years before anything happens? These, thing, these things do tend to take a long time. Yeah, and who knows where we are in terms of our position in the European Union by the time any case might have been heard and concluded. But Mr Beattie's asking very good questions, but they're not really questions for the Scottish Government. They're questions for those making the accusations and believe that they have the evidence uh, to, to challenge it, what I'm trying to reassure committee of is we abide by the rules, we want a level playing field, that's the case we would make, um, but for those making the accusations they would need to, to report it if they felt it was credible enough, notwithstanding the uh, pressures that, that go along with a uh, judicial process. Given the allegations made by BIFAB, do you, are you satisfied that this is not a general concern uh, in connection with business elsewhere within the Scottish economy? Has no, there been I, any evidence of it? I haven't seen evidence to suggest that this is a general issue in the Scottish economy, no. 
and there's a direct answer to the question. Okay. Um, Andy Whiteman. So just following that point up, I mean, on, in relation to your answer to the previous question, you have a, a seat on the board, you own part of this company. Surely it would be appropriate to ask the company to um, stack up its what evidence it has and, if necessary, push that push for that complaint to be made as a, as a shareholder? Well, I have said to, a, when I've met the company, what the legal routes are, but that's open to the company. You would need to ask Bifab why they choose not to pursue that route, and it might be for the reasons that Colin Beatty's given, about time, um, about um, process, but it really is for the company to consider whether they want to pursue that action or not. I personally have not seen evidence um, that would give me personally confidence that uh, there has been wrongdoing, but that's not to say that the company is wrong or doesn't have that evidence themselves. But, but that but would not be for Scottish Government to raise, and you know, uh, it is for the company to raise if they believe, as per the comments they've given to your uh, committee, that there is uh, uh, wrongdoing and flouting of stated rules. But my question is that you sit on the board. You can no, ask, I don't sit on the board. No, the Scottish Government is represented on the board. Your representative on the board could put that forward as an agenda item. And no, the company would need to put that forward. I think the shareholders and, and the directors of the company ultimately govern the company. Uh, Convener, I, I think you'd be better asking the company why they would not want to progress a legal challenge uh, to the Commission. I mean, my, I, I could spend um, years and energy on this, or I can do what I'm doing, which is trying to secure them work. We're not, we're not, we're not inviting you to take the challenge. Uh, well, That's so refreshing. Might, be, might, might be behind some of Mr Beatty's questions. But I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm asking you whether you could use your, uh, the fact that you have a seat on the board to, at a board meeting, ask the company uh, it, what evidence it has I'm, to bring I'm, forward a paper to the well, next board meeting. Can be, I'm happy to say again to the company... If you believe that you have evidence uh, that there has been contravention and you wish to take that up by way of complaint to the Commission, you know, that is for the company to do. The Scottish Government should not be encouraging or discouraging that legal action. That would be for the company themselves. I get no, that we're but, a shareholder. But, but, but the share, a share, well, shareholder has a duty. Mr. Lightman, we're saying the same thing now. We're saying the same mm. thing. Okay. We're both saying that if the company believes that they have evidence and they wish to take it further, they should. But that's for the company to decide. I now, it goes back to what Mr Mason was asking about. Do we take a role in the operational and management decisions of the company? And I said, no, we don't. So we don't instruct the board. We're there to understand what the company's doing or lead the board, whether they understand what the company's doing and understand the wider issues and the forensic issues. If the company wishes to raise a, a state aid complaint, that is entirely a matter for them. But it wouldn't be a management decision for us. But publicly, I'm saying, you know, it's the same as you. If the company thinks they have evidence, then they should raise a complaint. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll leave with you. I mean, I, I, just, I just think um, if the Scottish Government is a shareholder in a private company... Um, it, I would have thought, has a, a duty to the taxpayer to raise this inside the company. But I'll just leave it there. But I think I've said publicly what I've said privately I, I, in I, terms I, of I, if I they know. have evidence, they should raise it. But there's something very peculiar about a government within a member state acting in a, a certain way of member state complaining about another member state. We're not the member state. We're Scotland within the member state. So I'm just saying it's very subtle here, but you know, we're saying the same thing. If there is evidence, the company should take it forward, raise a complaint, and surely justice will be done. Well, John Mason may want to ask about this. Yeah, well, again, uh, from a slightly different angle, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that Scottish Enterprise wouldn't have a role in this because their job, presumably, is to try and get businesses to come here instead of another member state. And they, I know, have a lot of restrictions what how they can help a company because of the state aid rules. So I would have thought, just as they are trying to do the best for inward investors, they would also be keeping an eye on what other countries might be doing and if they were 
on a borderline or kind of pushing the rules. And I mean, my impression was that it was relatively easy to raise the question of state aid because, for example, uh, I've had Rangers supporters raising the question of whether Celtic got state aid and the European Commission did follow that up, apparently. So it didn't seem to be very difficult to at least raise the question. Could Scottish Enterprise not have a role in this? Uh, Kimi, I don't want to get into any of those complexities, but other than to say that I don't see the Scottish Government's Enterprise Agency as trying to act as the policing authority for European state aid rules. That's what the European authorities are for. I'm happy to ask um, my official convener, if you wish, to see a bit more detail on the appropriateness of that action as I've tried to describe it. So I, I think I'll largely be adding some more detail to what Mr Mackay's point there was. It, but effectively, so the Scottish Government and, and Scottish Enterprise and our enterprise agencies, we work very closely with the business and make sure that any, any aid or any support we give is watertight from a state aid perspective because, as committee will be aware, if, if we act in a way that wasn't that, in that case, it wouldn't be the government that the, the case would be against. It would be the funds would be um, clawed back from the company. So it is kind of our first priority to ensure that everything we are doing is, is compatible with, with the state aid requirements uh, and, and the, the kind of knowledge and expertise in our enterprise agencies are important in, in helping us with that. Um, in terms of the, the point about um, is it for Scottish Government to advise the company uh, uh, to, to make a claim? It does go back to the point that we, we have a, our, our position is that we do not interfere in, in management decisions and do not interfere in operational decisions. And they are, they are for the company to make our, our main role on the board is as an, as, as an observer uh, to ensure that information flows freely and to ensure that if the, the company has an ask of government that we can act quickly on it and respond as fast as we can. Um, but. Although, although the process and uh, to to make a state aid um, a complaint uh, is is relatively is relatively light touch, the, the, there's a well documented procedures on the commission website about how any interested party, not just Bifab but anybody across the the EU, that feels that they are um, they, they, their, their business has been affected by this, is well within their rights to raise a complaint. It still is a management decision because Bifab would have to resort. Uh, devote management time, we'd have to devote, devote resources to gather the intelligence, to gather the evidence and to make that case. And that's not for government necessarily to, to take that position. Uh, I mean, I think possibly what seems slightly puzzling is the, the position that seems to be adopted because I, I'm not sure other regional governments in European countries would take the view that it's not something that's of interest to them if companies within their area are being affected potentially by this. So it, it does seem to me that it's something the Scottish Government would have an interest in. Uh, you, you don't accept that? No, I, that's different language. Do I have an interest in? Yes. Do I want to launch a complaint on behalf of another company in which we have a stake in? No. But I suppose the question is, what is the Scottish Government doing about it then? As I have uh, described, you know, said to the company, if they feel that they have the evidence that merits a complaint, they should raise that complaint with the Commission. Ultimately, it would be for the European authorities to decide. I personally haven't seen the, the, the evidence, and I referred to this earlier, the evidence that would suggest... Uh, that would conclude that there has been wrongdoing, but the company themselves may may hold that kind of open book information. But I suppose and the I other think, the, I, I the other point, coming secretary, <coughs> is that the law, including on state aid in particular, is fairly complex. It's not mm. a question of it being clear necessarily. So one has to take an active interest in it and the interpretation of it and how it is applied. Um, and surely that is something. Well, can I say, convener, if uh, I, I understand why you're pursuing the line of question, and I hope you can understand why I'm protecting the interests of the government here. Um, if the outcome we are trying to achieve is to ensure that we get more onshore supply chain benefits from the offshore work, then the more fruitful ways to do that is, is around the, the channels that I've suggested. Um, there is an interest in, clearly, um, the level playing field, I want that to be delivered. Uh, but the only way that can truly be tested if there's a complaint from a company, that will be down to the company. 
That is not for Scottish Government. We'll take an interest, absolutely, of course we will. Um, but that is not for the uh, Scottish Government to launch that uh, complaint. And as I say, the company will have more insight into open book. And I think you really need to pro if you want to develop this further, I think you really need to speak to the company about this. I cannot speak for them as to why, what information leads them to the conclusion uh, that uh, there isn't a level playing field and what they intend to do about it is, is legitimate questions. And I, I would put that back to the company rather than try and have me to speak for them if it's uh, a matter of concern, which I can understand why it is. We'll move on to questions from Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener. Um, and I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary recognises we're all on the same page in wanting BIFAB to secure um, supply chain work from billion pound wind projects in Scotland. So I welcome his change of heart um, by inviting a member of the committee to the next summit. Um, we received communication from Tony Mackay, an economist based up in Inverness, and he informed the committee that Global Energy Group at NIG had been more successful at winning new work than BIFAB. Um, he points to a lack of support from HI and SE for the current underperformance of the supply chain. Um, do you agree with his assessment? And if so, what do you think the wider supply chain can learn from the Global Energy Group? No, I don't agree with that uh, assessment overall, because when I've engaged with uh, developers, um, they, if you want to boil it down, a lot of those companies say they give awards based on just cost. They just say it's cost. They put cost. It's cheaper to do else work elsewhere, for whatever reason. So I wouldn't say it's down to a lack of uh, entrepreneurship or a lack of coordination or indeed a lack of investment. Although it's, it'll be self-fulfilling if, you know, if investment comes, the capacity can improve and the, the pipeline of work uh, will bring a whole host of benefits. But when, when I've engaged with companies, as Jackie Bailey would expect, my energies have gone into engaging with developers and expressing the disappointment in Scotland, whilst companies have been getting consents and enjoying the benefits of the subsidies and Scotland's not been getting the work up and expressing that disappointment and opportunity than when contracts have been placed trying to raise expectations around what Scotland gets. The critique I've had back is largely cost. Largely, it's cheaper to do work elsewhere. And we don't have to do it in the UK. We don't have to do it in Scotland. And they don't say the words, you can't compel us. But they know that we've not been able to compel us for the reasons we've discussed this morning, that there's no conditionality on those awards of subsidies. So I would disagree that it's... Uh, it's just about, you know, Q's lack of support from an enterprise agency. Um, the companies that I've engaged with have been able to say it's about cost. Now, what I'm saying is there are, there are some countries that would be very hard to compete with. Maybe, that, maybe that's because of um, labour rates, you know, wages and uh, uh, other matters of scale. But we need to create... You know, as competitive and incentivised location as possible within Scotland. And even when we've done that, we'll, we'll still suffer on costs. I mean, that's one of the issues that BIFAB <coughs> excuse me, has, has said that no matter how competitive they can be, uh, that um, when it just comes to pure costs, they might not win. But on quality, they can. And on local content, absolutely, they can. So I think there's a, a number of ways uh, into this issue. Do I encourage enterprise agencies, Scottish Enterprise and High, to be as creative, innovative and supportive as possible? Yes, I do. And, of course, it's, uh, it is a mixed picture in Scotland. There have been successful yards and enterprises around renewables. And some of those are those who have been able to collaborate and create a shared capacity, wider expertise. And once you have a pipeline of work, I think it's easier to invest. You have a long-term future. You can invest. You can scale up the workforce. You can do more around research and development and so on. And then, of course, there can be further support from the enterprise agencies. Um, and I actually think that um, uh, Global Energy Group uh, is a good example of that. It's also true to say that different parts of the sector are targeting different parts of the market. Bifab's targeting fabrication. Some of the other um, companies are targeting manufacturing or servicing or location. So different companies are doing different things as well, which I think might explain some of the different experiences. OK, I accept the Cabinet Secretary's wider points, but um, I simply note that the Scottish Government, through High, um, put in £1.8 to the NIG yard, 
um, and you talked about conditionality, that is an area where the Scottish Government could apply conditions. Where I'm going with this is Global Energy boosted on its website that it was anti-trade union and had a non-unionised workforce. Now, that was the Scottish Government's approach to support that in 2012. Um, I'm assuming that, that you as Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government now would not support such an approach um, of a company that openly boasts of being anti-union. Uh, no, I wouldn't encourage any company to be anti-union. Thank you very much. Jamie Holger Johnson. Um, thank you. Um, it was regards to the agencies, the Highlands and Islands Enterprise and uh, Scottish Enterprise and what they'd been doing. I also was just going to ask you how they coordinate with uh, other agencies in Scotland, such as the Crown Estate, uh, Skills Development Scotland, in terms of making sure that there's the right environment, skills, facilities, etc., to take advantage of offshore, should we be able to um, fully take advantage of it. So there's a range of work that they do. Some of it is around um, expert uh, support. They'll assist with conferences, uh, bringing together uh, people with interests in the renewable sector. They'll make connections of foreign direct investment and what companies might be interested in doing, look at exports as well. Um, and of course, they do engage with each other, the sectoral experts, as well as the wider um, account-managed companies. And there are, there are successes around enterprise investment into companies working in renewables um, as well. So I think there is a degree of uh, cooperation, leadership, uh, that can be provided, again, all within uh, state aid rules. Uh, fabrication does appear to be the uh, slightly more... Um, difficult territory, if you pardon the pun, because um, of the nature of the business. Um, so uh, while some uh, renewables companies have been able to expand, some op operations have not been able to deliver for fabrication, but that's clearly what we want to change. But across the sector in renewables and in uh, energy specifically, Scotland's got a very strong reputation. That's why we're holding international conferences in Scotland. And Scottish companies have a strong presence both here and abroad. But the very niche area that we feel most sorely let down, in my opinion, feels like the onshore manufacturing, uh, industrial jobs, uh, particularly around fabrication. Um, uh, and Bifab is a pretty good example of that sense of disappointment when we know the staff can do so much, we can scale up so quickly, uh, we can deliver, there's new ownership of the company, the trade unions and the staff are engaged. And I do believe that the, you know, the campaign is right, that they really are ready to go in terms of a pipeline of work. But Scottish Enterprise, uh, Highlands and Islands and Enterprise uh, and others are, are very active in this uh, area. And given the potential for offshore, I mean, some of the, some of the single, single fields of offshore turbines are, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of turbines, would we, are we in a position that we can actually cater for that? Uh, not at the moment necessarily, but are there plans to make sure that we've got the fabrication yard, not just by fab, but obviously across my region, the Highlands and Islands, have we got the skills or the plans to get the skills in place? And what are the time scales on that? Because obviously, um, I was just interested in when the next, the next uh, uh, um, group, group of, um, of licenses are going to be put out. Are we, are we going to be in that position that we're, we're ready for that? Uh, do you mean CFD licenses so, or no, sorry, Crown for, Estate? For the Crown Estate licenses. <coughs> okay, I'll come back to that. Just by way of um, detail, because you've give me enough time to, to find it. Uh, on the offshore wind expert support programme, 172 companies have worked with the enterprise agencies since 2016. So I think that shows the scale of companies. Um, three companies from that have secured contracts totalling £35 million pounds, uh, in the last year uh, alone. In the Highlands and Islands area from March 2010 to May 2019, Highlands and Islands and Enterprise invested more than £41.4 million towards energy-related infrastructure facilities across the Highlands and Islands, uh, against a combined total investment of over £190.2 million from private and public sources. So that's a bit of detail that you were asking about in terms of enterprise agencies' uh, engagement. Uh, in terms of capacity, uh, with the base will in the world, even by fab admit they couldn't do all the work that could mm -hmm. possibly be done in the uh, offshore sector onshore. They just want a fighting chance and enough work to build up their capacity again to increase that workforce, which 
you know, it's been a bit down to about 80, I think, at the moment. It's about 120 of a work. That could be scaled up very quickly, so we could scale up and get on with more contracts very quickly. And, of course, Scotland, we have the capacity, we've got the quality, we've got a talented workforce, and we've got the, um, the yards and the infrastructure. And, of course, it's on our shores. It's, you know, it's our waters, it's on our site. It's that environmental benefit of doing the work as, as closely as possible. But for the next round of... A licensing. We are so the new arrangements. Hopefully, we'll have in place, designed and in place in terms of the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Will be in place for the next leasing round for Crown Estate, Scotland. Yep. Um, interestingly named. Um, Sorry, which comes? Which is when? It, I'll ask David to come oh, back okay. to that, and then contract for difference. It, right now, it, the UK government is looking at uh, reviewing that right now. So the sooner that can be concluded, the better. But it takes you back to the policy choice. We will be choosing, where possible, for that local content. UK government needs to do the same. See if we're both doing the same. Think of the industrial benefits. Think of the jobs. Think of supply chain content that will be coming right across the whole of UK and to Scotland if both of us are using that lever in the fashion that I'm describing. Um, David can cover the next round of um, Crown Estate leasing um, Scotland. Yeah. Uh, in terms of what will happen, um, obviously the Scotland process will commence later this year. Uh, which will sit alongside a, a sectoral plan um, from the Scottish Government identifying the areas. Uh, I suppose um, one way to look at it is we're still exploring the actual um, terms and conditions of the Crown Estate leasing, as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined. And once those terms and conditions are in place, we'll be, then be able to see how they'll factor into the, the process and um, be considered as kind of leases go from an exclusivity into a kind of formal lease stage. Okay. And, and again, if we are able to, or if you're able to um, factor in the conditionality and, the, you, know, to, to, uh, 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 you, you know, to boost the opportunities for domestic, domestic companies, how will, the High, how will Highlands Islands Enterprise, how will Scottish Enterprise, how will all the other um, ent uh, the bodies that, that related to that, how will they be, uh, I suppose, supercharged to be able to meet that demand? Because if you're talking about one, one development having 200 turbines, that's a huge amount of work which the capacity probably isn't there at the moment. So how will we make sure that um, we're ready to meet that? Mr Johnson agrees that will be a nice problem to it have if we're then but talking it's still a problem about that's got to the oversupply of work coming to Scottish Yards. How will we manage it would be a nice problem. Well, it's the old Alex Ferguson have. problem of the best players to pick, but it's still a problem that's got to be addressed. So I think some of that work has already begun at the summit when the sector... You know, because I, I, the summit was partly to say, right, we're now going to have to look at the big stick because we've tried to incentivise you. Uh, what are you bringing to the table? I kind of thought, what will the offer be from the sector? And it was to explore coordination. It was to explore investing in the supply chain to try and support better coordination. Um, and that's partly where, the, where this announcement of £100 million pounds has, has come from. It was first trailed at that summit. So I think some of the work has already begun to try and collaborate, to try and build up that capacity. And we'll also remove yet another excuse as to why contracts haven't been placed in domestic yards, you know, it's because the sector themselves will have a responsibility uh, to uh, develop uh, and, and allow for their improvement and stimulate their improvement as well. So, yes, we'll work with Scottish Enterprise. Yes, we'll work with the sector. And I think if some of the developers, uh, or sorry, businesses, more accurately, coordinated with each other. You know, they, they might say, Look, could you do some of the work here? Mm -hmm. We can do some of the work. A bit more collaboration and partnership. But overall, that would be good for the country rather than just have uh, individual companies vying for, <laughs> for competition with each other. So, but it is also a very specialist sector. So fabrication is different from service and is different from the, some of the construction. So we absolutely will explore all of that. But the first key big thing we've got to do is to have that game-changer moment and companies actually awarding contracts to Scotland. But I, I say again what I said at the start, very topical and very timely. I'm cautiously optimistic that Bifab will secure work. Okay. Thank you. Um, question from Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, so underpinning all our discussions this morning has been the presumption that these are multinational private companies that are the developers drawing in capital from a range of sources. But, of course, uh, many of the companies that they're um, offering work to are themselves state-owned enterprises um, of other countries. The government's proposed a publicly-owned energy company, 
Uh, we've got Sweden's Vattenfall, who's a state-owned company um, operating offshore. Um, surely another option for the future, of course, is to explore the role of a, a state-owned company to be the developer, and then it would have almost limitless control over who it supplied contracts to. Yeah, it's very, very interesting a point. Indeed, it would. Uh, and that's a point I make to uh, the companies, the developers. So I point out that government's bound by the law, so are companies. But if a company chooses to put the right decision in terms of um, invest your work in a particular country, um, they can do it. They can make that decision. So I'm already using that argument. Whatever the status of the company, if they're getting consents in Scotland, they should be investing in uh, industrial jobs in Scotland. Uh, as to future um, Scottish government having a uh, state-owned, publicly-run renewables company, that's a very interesting proposition that Mr Whiteman has suggested to me. I'm not sure it would be up and running quickly enough to give contracts to BIFAB, um, but it's a very interesting proposition. Well, well, it's your proposition. You, 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 the government is committed to establishing a publicly owned energy company. Yeah, but you are specifically talking about renewables, offshore renewables sector here, so we're talking about slightly different things. Well, as I understand it, we've had discussions in this committee on this question. The scope of that publicly owned energy company is still very much under discussion, so I'm just inviting you to consider how its scope could embrace um, being a state owned enterprise in this sector. Obviously, some place down the line. Yeah, I'm happy to pass the comments on to the Energy Minister who leads on this issue. All right, thank you very much. If there are no further questions from committee members, thank you to the Cabinet Secretary. I'll now suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session.